Hi, everybody. My name is Hannah Hostick. I am co-president of the Friends of the Sterling Road Library. It's a pleasure to welcome you all here today. Um, if you are, if your microphone is not on mute, please mute yourself. Um, I'll try to mute everyone if I once I stop talking. Um, it's a beautiful day in Hollywood, Florida, in Broward County today, and we're so pleased that you took time off um, from this day to attend our uh, monthly meeting with the Hollywood Historical Society. It's my pleasure to introduce Karen Albertson, the Executive Director of the Hollywood Historical Society, who will introduce today's program. Karen. Hi everybody, it's Karen. Um, unfortunately, Willis Morgan, our previously announced speaker, had to cancel, but we rescheduled him for next year. Um, in his place, we're going to be showing a video prepared by four Beachside Montessori School seventh graders uh, who uh, for their history project in 2015. It's all about our founder, Joseph W. Young, from a teenager's point, a seventh grader's point of view. Um, and it just happens that this is Joseph Young's birthday month. In addition to that video, we're also going to share with you a video of our first historic plaque presentation, which was on the historic home of our president now, Clive Taylor. And I hope you enjoy these videos and questions will follow afterwards. Clive, you ready? Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome. And we've practiced this two times before you got on the air, but that doesn't mean it's going to work now. So let's see what happens here. The suspense is killing me. Okay, the first video uh, that we're going to play, like uh, Karen mentioned, was a video done by the students, and um, I've got it ready to roll, so we're just going to let her rip. <laughs> One man had a dream to form a perfect city. That man was Joseph W. Young, the visionary who never let anything stand in the way of his dream. What Mr. Young was trying to do was to build a city that would be beautiful and comfortable for the people that lived in it. And he was building an entire city. He wasn't just building a development, which you see today, which is a small group of houses, but they're part of a bigger city. He was going to build a whole city. He started with pretty much bare land, and I just will quickly point out, this is the Dixie Highway. That was the main road. There wasn't any other road. <laughs> that had been built by Carl Fisher to get people from Indianapolis down to Miami, because Fisher was developing Miami as a resort, not as a city. And then the next other thing right along here was the FEC Railroad. Florida East Coast was built by Flagler, and that came first. Hollywood didn't exist and nobody thought about it. Joseph Young saw potential. People say this is where he stood out. He bought the beach in order to use the ocean side. Somebody in Hollandale sold him the beach. He was able to picture the entire city. He knew how to plan streets and parks and how to hire the best people. He had financial support. He could hire the best team of engineers and architects. The engineers based their drawings on his plan and vision. He purchased land from Dania farmers. The land was bare, covered only in palmetto scrub. After the land was cleared, the surveyors began laying out a 10-acre circle. Young hired a team of engineers, construction workers, and salespeople. Together, the team built roads and public utilities for cities. He built hotels, including the Parkview Hotel, Hollywood Beach Hotel, and Hollywood Golf and Country Club. There are many examples of how he advertised to draw people to invest in Hollywood. When he was building Hollywood, there were advertisements in national magazines. Here's an example from 1925 for Literary Digest. The public pool was a very big local and tourist attraction. It was called the casino. It wasn't actually a casino. There wasn't any gambling. The casino was open to everyone. The Golf and Country Club was another beautiful Spanish-style building. It was pretty cool at the time because it had a retractable roof and glass-style floors that flashed different colors. He built what was called Tent City. It was supposed to be a temporary type of place just until the hotel was finished. There were hundreds of tents. They were not the tents that we think of today. They were very luxurious, 
with kitchens, maids, bathrooms, showers, and changing rooms to go to the beach. Unfortunately, Tent City only lasted one year because in September of that year, it was destroyed by a hurricane. buildings damaged or destroyed. Every boat in the harbor was sunk or driven on shore. The city docks gone in the face of furious winds. In all, a 60-mile stretch of Florida's east coast from Miami to Palm Beach devastated to the tune of a hundred million dollars. Water, food, medicine, clothing, and shelter had to be provided for more than 35,000 people left homeless. In addition to supplies, trains brought in troops to halt the vandalism and looting that broke out. The hurricane of 1926 swept all the way across the lower east coast through the Everglades to the Gulf of Mexico. It's still known as the worst. On September 18, 1926, a major hurricane swept through Hollywood and damaged or destroyed most of the city. Young's building survived, but it was a big setback for the fledging city. People left the city, suffering financial loss, and the population decreased by 90%. The barge acting as a bridge on the beach was blown over a mile away. Families evacuated the beach during the massive storm. Tent City on the beach was completely destroyed. We read the journal of a little girl who wrote about her experience during the hurricane. She grabbed a Raggedy Ann doll before she and her family evacuated their home in the middle of the night. City resident Edith Whitson reflected on her feelings. She said, I shall never forget what it meant to Hollywood when they realized that their dream had been completely smashed by this unavoidable hurricane. Most of us felt that we were all set for life, a life of ease before us. Then overnight, everything wiped out. We knew that Mr. Young came immediately, and I just can't imagine the shock that it was to him. Everybody had worked so hard, from the least to the greatest, for building up Hollywood. Had this hurricane not happened, Mr. Young's dream would have gone on and on. Shortly after the hurricane, Joseph Young wrote a letter to all city residents asking them to stay and rebuild with him. He also continued to build Hollywood Harbor. Unfortunately, he died suddenly of a heart attack inside his mansion in 1934. The funeral was held at his house and in honor of his memory, Harding Circle was renamed Young Circle. Joseph Young's courage and vision built Hollywood. His legacy of City Beautiful inspires us. The historic Young Mansion still stands today. This is the Joseph W. Young House. This is called the Young Mansion. Um, while we were walking, this is the living room of his house. Over here is the library where he died talking to his publicity man um, in 1934. The house is still as originally beautiful as it was back then. In 2000, Young was honored as a great Floridian, an award for people who made a significant contribution in the history and culture of Florida. His mansion on Hollywood Boulevard was added to National Register of Historic Places.
Today, Hollywood is home to almost 150,000 people. Hollywood Beach is still a popular tourist destination and new resorts are being built. There are over 170 schools. Hollywood Harbor is now called Port Everglades and is one of the busiest cruise ports in the world. Joseph W. Young will be very proud of Hollywood today. Okay, is everybody uh, with us? You're muted, Karen. Is Hannah still with us? Of course I am. Excellent. So do you wanna go ahead with the next video or just talk about this one for a little bit? Does anybody have any questions about the video that those incredible students did? I loved it. I love being able to go into Joseph Young's house, a lot of people drive by it a million times, but no, not many people have been able to have access to it. And, and that, that interior is the most original part of that house with the wood beams and the stucco plaster on the interior walls and the fireplaces. It's just as it was in 1925. It's incredible. I think it was outstanding. I can't believe these kids put it together. I congratulate them. Yeah, and the hurricane is, uh, wasn't just a Hollywood disaster. It was all of South Florida, Miami. It bankrupted Carl Fisher. It bankrupted George Merrick. All these boomtown cities, that was it for them. It just pushed the reset button on everybody. So we were not alone in that. But I think Hollywood suffered more because we were such a large city with the port and uh, everything else that was going on. Um, so I will um, start the second one. And I got a oh, question from Lynn Smith. Uh, thank you, Clive. Another fabulous, fabulous, fabulous thing. It's, it makes me cry every time. I, I had see nothing it. to do with it. I'm just pressing the play button. Okay, well, then whoever did it with the kids is great. And it's really good for these kids to learn about history at the age they are. If we exactly. don't teach them, they won't remember. Exactly. You, we, we have a new board member. I'd like to welcome her, Susan Oustheim. I see that she's on the Zoom. She just retired from South Broward High School after many years of teaching. And we want to continue that outreach into the, the um, you know, the school age kids to learn about the city and get them interested in the history because they're the ones that are going to be holding the keys one day when we're gone. So it's good to indoctrinate them now. That's with right. Interest in history before, you know, so they can take over the reins. None of us and are younger. I just can't believe one of the four kids was a student of mine at South Broward, Jeremiah. I love it. So uh, I was thrilled. I'm going to call him and tell him I saw his film. <laughs> Famous again. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's line up the next one. This is the, uh, we brought back the plaque program. It had taken a 20 year hiatus and we thought it was a good year, to, a good time to bring it back. A lot of mid-century modern homes are now eligible to receive a plaque, a historic marker. Um, so this was our first one and it was the first ever 50s home to be recognized by the Historical Society because they are now over 50 years old and qualify for designation based on some other criteria. So let's see if I can get as lucky with this video as I did the last one. There we go. Yes. We are. 
we go. in Hollywood from 1940 until the time that he passed away in 1983 and he designed so many buildings in Hollywood and he's really kind of known for his mid-century style which is what this house is so the Hollywood Historical Society is kicking off their plaque program and honoring Ken Spry's house 1952 tropical modern design and it's called Jalousy House and we're expecting the mayor and Carol Shuham and Linda Sherwood and I believe Kevin Biederman and we're gonna have a kickoff ceremony in honoring of Ken Spry. There's a whole storyboard about him. This guy was so busy in Hollywood. There's hundreds of articles about him in Hollywood and he dies and he gets three lines in the paper. This guy never got a proper obituary and an homage to the legacy that he left. The, the band shell in the circle, the war memorial in the circle, the Entrada and Hotel, the Hollywood Theater, uh, the Sheldon Hotel on the beach, Hugh Taylor Birch's house in Birch State Park. He designed in 1940. This guy was all over the map and he was president of the Hollywood Historical Society in 1976. So he was a modernist architect that was pro-preservation. And I am so excited that people could realize that you could be pro-development and, and a modernist architect while still preserving your past, which is really what you have to look at when you're going forward. It sets the tone for the city. So um, he is definitely worthy of honorable mention this far after his passing. And I'm so happy that we're doing it today. Three, two, one! Woo! is recognized nationally as being an intact business district. So we plaqued some 49 sites in the downtown alone. Today we're bringing the program back and since 2000, 2021, national standards are 50 years or older. So now we have anything from up to 1970 that's worthy of recognition. And it's, it's interesting that mid-century modern is so hot right now that now all mid-century modern homes can be recognized and marked as a historic uh, um, architecture. And because all new buildings right now seem to be mid-century modern, 
we're just 50 years out of mid-century. And it's interesting that after the Spanish Mediterranean revival in the 20s, in the 80s and the 90s, everybody wanted Spanish Mediterranean because it was 50 years from the 20s. And now here we are, 50 years later, and everybody is celebrating mid-century modern architecture. So we're starting that program, and we're very excited about it. And um, the criteria has to be certain architecture, has to be noted architecture, a lot of original features, but it also be uh, a structure that's associated with a person or event in the history of Hollywood. And a perfect example of that is there's a house called the Jones Home that was plaqued uh, in 1990s, and it's on 17th Avenue around the corner. It's a two-story clapped wood board home that is not significantly designed, it's just square. But it was built in 1927. Why it has a plaque is that house was built out of the wreckage of the 1926 storm. Oh so after the 1926 storm, the people, whoever owned that house, salvaged all the wreckage from the lumber around and built that house. So it doesn't have to be architecturally significant, it has to tell a story. That house tells a story. And if you want to go by, I have a list of the plaques that we plaqued right here. You can drive by on your way home and look, you can see the plaque. It's, it's just like they, the day they built the house. Um, so there's been some conversation, is 50 years old enough? Well. If you were here in the 70s and 80s, you remember Barbara Capitan, I think her last name was, on South Beach. Mm -hmm. In 1976, she started championing the Art Deco hotels. And you know what people said? They're ugly, they're disgusting, there's wall units hanging out of them, uh, it's a bunch of retirees down there, and we need to get rid of all of them. Do you know they were only 45 years old at that point? Mm -hmm. It was the forward thinking of people realizing the time to recognize stuff is not when it's gone, it's when it's still standing, and it's just getting on the cusp. Yeah. I want to talk about the land that you're standing in right now. If you wind the clock back 100 years, you're going to be standing in Dania Tomato Farms. This entire area was known for Dania Tomato Farmers, named after the Danish people that settled Dania in 1904, which was part of Dade County. Broward County didn't come into existence until 1915. So when Joseph Young got here, he had to start buying the land from the Danish tomato farmers, and the Hollywood Country Club was purchased off of a, Dama a Dania tomato farmer. Mm -hmm. Dania tomatoes were world famous. They shipped them all over the country uh, because the railroad was right here, and they had packing houses all over Dania. It was their claim to fame. And so much so that they had a, a Dania tomato festival every year, and each year some lucky girl from Dania was crowned a tomato queen. And then they had a tomato fight. They trucked in all these rotten tomatoes and threw them at each other. The Danes, you can't take the baking out of the Danes, apparently. I mean, they just, you know, they know how to have a good time. So, um, I want to talk about, so, also, north of Johnson Street was really not part of Hollywood. Joseph Young had Johnson to Washington, so this part of, of Hollywood was being developed by other developers. This was known as St. James Park. So, when the city incorporated in 1925, it got swallowed up in the incorporation sometime. We're really not even sure when this became part of Hollywood, but the original map, which I have somewhere, shows that... Hollywood stops north of Johnson Street. That's the original map, but I have a little thing where, and I found the original survey of my street. Since this wasn't Grant Street then, it was called Royal Palm Boulevard. Oh, wow. I do too, and I'm sure Grant did something awful that we don't know about, and I'm going to find out what it is, because I think Royal Palm is going to increase my value. And there was supposed to be a median in the street, and I've always wondered since I moved here, if you stop at this stop sign, the road does not line up. Right. There's a distinct jog, and I'm like, what the hell? What, what surveyor screwed up here? It's because it's supposed to be wide, like 17th, and this shows a median in the middle, which I'm assuming they were going to plant royal palm trees. Oh, yeah. So, um, that's a little interesting. Uh, there's another clause for you to take. Exactly. To I'm not really going to do that, by the way. It's too much work. But maybe Lori can help me. <laughs> um, I want to talk about Ken Spry now. Ken Spry. This guy was so active, I was blown away. When I started researching the architect of my home, there are literally hundreds of articles about Ken Spry in the newspaper, from the Fort Lauderdale News to the Miami Herald. He came here in the 30s, and he got a job at an architectural firm in Fort Lauderdale, and one of his first jobs was designing the house for Hugh Taylor Birch, of Birch State Park. The house is still standing. It was his personal home. He lived with his 
um, former son-in-law and new wife, Evelyn Bartlett, at the Bonnet House, and he decided, I can't live with these two newlyweds anymore, and he could design, Kent's Bride designed his home. Kent's Bride comes to Hollywood, loves it, who doesn't love Hollywood, decides to live here, and starts getting extremely involved in the community. He did the, the old band show in the Hollywood Circle, which kind of reminds me of the Hollywood Bowl in California. He designed the war memorial behind the band shell. He designed the Entrada Hotel, which when that thing was built, it was gigantic. It was like something that people were talking about. It was the largest hotel on Federal Highway, all up and down Federal Highway. Um, he designed several homes, the Sheldon Hotel on the beach, the Hollywood Theater on, John, on Washington and 26th, and he was also involved in the Hollywood Theater. The Hollywood Theater was a civic theater, and in the 30s, it was shut down because of the war in the late 30s, because the war started in the early 40s. And after the war, after Pence Pride was here, he got the theater group together, raised money, organized it, and got the city to donate the land on 26th Avenue and Washington Street, where he designed and, and helped. Everybody helped build this theater. It was a community effort. And the other interesting thing about the theater, it was a civic theater. There weren't professional actors. The people were bankers, lawyers. They were residents, and they practiced, and they put on shows for the community. It was a very respected civic theater. Um, so when he passes away, Ken Spry, after I see all these articles about Ken Spry, I'm looking, and I'm looking, and I'm looking, and I can't find his obituary because it's three lines. This guy did all of this, and this is his obituary right here. Ken Spry passes away, uh, service at the Elks National Cemetery. That's it. He was also president of the Hollywood Historical Society in 1975. Oh he throws God. a hurricane party in 1976 to commemorate the 1926 hurricane that devastated all of South Florida to raise money. Ken Spry was a modernist architect. See, I don't know why Ken's doing this. He really doesn't want the attention, I think. So what I really find interesting about Ken Spry, and these are the original homes to the plan. If you want to see the original plans, they're right here on the board. But Ken Spry was such a modernist architect. He was pro-development. He wanted quality development. But he was also into historic preservation. And I don't know if you guys all remember the Dania Elementary School, which used to be South Broward. Dania Elementary was built in 1950, and it was known as South Broward. That's why South Broward is over 100 years old. The school itself is over 100 years old. Bayard Lukens builds the building that's now South Broward in 1949. That South Broward moves to Hollywood, and that becomes the Dania Elementary. And what happens to Dania Elementary, it sits idle for years and years and years because the county builds a new Dania Elementary School behind the old one. And Ken Spry, on historic preservation, his quote, he wanted to save the Joe Young House. He wanted to save the First City Hall. And he was very interested in historic preservation while designing new exciting buildings. And I think the two go hand in hand. And one complements the other. So I think it's important. But his quote on the Dania Elementary School, which looked nothing like when it was built. It got hit by a tornado in 1951. Half of the building was destroyed, and they had to rebuild half of it. But he says, while I'm not making a judgment as to whether it's good architecturally, the old Dania school is worthy of preservation because by its presence alone, it reflects the attitudes, ideas important to the people of the time that it was built. And that's what's important. The buildings that we lose in Hollywood are the pioneer buildings of our city. They were the first buildings that were ever built in this land. There was nothing here before Joseph Young got here. And the buildings that are still standing from the 20s that he built are pioneer buildings. And they may not look like they did, but they're still standing and they tell the story in their size and their scale. So, um, now let's talk about the house. I have to have those because I'm dyslexic and my mind is all over the place. This is a mid-century modern house. I, in an ideal world, if Ken wasn't raining on us, we'd be standing over there and I would point out the features. But it's a sloped shed roof, a very low pitch. There's open wood beam ceilings in the house that have been brought out. You see the three wood beams that come out of the house. Those are a continuation from the wood beams in the house. When you stand in the house, it's you can see jealousy windows in the roof line, and those same wood beams go out of the windows. 
These bricks used to be red brick that matched the pink terrazzo on the inside of the house. He uses a concrete eyebrow, which is almost Art Deco, on a mid-century modern house with these circle railings, which is also kind of an Art Deco throwback. And I think the two work really well together. I don't think that there's a problem doing that. There's a cluster of these houses on Johnson Street and 26th Avenue. When you drive down Johnson, the next time when we all go down Johnson, Marie does too on the way home. Hopefully she'll be driving this way soon. <laughs> Look on the right. Before you get to 26th Avenue, Isa has, yeah, we believe, a Ken's Fry right house. Right it's a very characteristic with the sloped roof. There's, yeah, there's 28 windows in this home. It was built before air conditioning. The design is genius because without air conditioning, the house faces east. You open the windows on the, on the east side. The heat slowly escapes out the jealousy windows. I think had air conditioning not been invented, this design would have gotten more popular. But some guy named Carrier <laughs> invented air conditioning, and then we became hermetically sealed in our homes now. And I love my jealousies because I'm never going to get radon poisoning. So. Oh, you have central air? I do, but it doesn't go on very often. My air goes off around October and goes on in April. So that's all I have to say. And I'd like, if the mayor would like to say a few words, please come on up. If you've got a big voice, or you've got, I can give you the megaphone, and you can use. No, the no. Well, I just want to thank the historical society. Uh, and listening to you, Clive, uh, really inspires the thought of um, how we should look at buildings. Uh, as well for me, uh, Carol had brought up the idea of 50 years old. I reacted and said, uh, Carol. Every house in Hollywood is almost 50 years old. Why should that be historic? But listening to you describe, you know, what particular houses mean in terms of their story, in this case, for example, who designed it, uh, makes me, you know, reconsider and kind of reappreciate perhaps what we do have. Um, and obviously, it's incumbent upon me as a mayor to to help, uh, I think, to conserve that and to uh, preserve that, so we can continue to, you know, feel special about our city and because it has its own story, as you're telling right now. So it's inspiring for me. So thank you. person of honor who is going to unveil the plaque for us. Wow. That's right. I didn't know that was my job. I just that is your that. job. But thank you, Clyde, and thank the Historical Society. I think without you guys, you know, this stuff would be lost. Um, it takes a, uh, a shepherd, and, and that's what you have done and Karen before you, and there's so much to be preserved. We're so fortunate to have all of this, but I think that it goes without saying in light of recent events that a plaque is not enough. A plaque is not enough. Yes. A plaque is lovely to tell all of us who already are interested that that building is old and when it was built. But for the purposes of protection in the future, you need to do more. And we've talked about taking each of these buildings individually and getting a certification through the Historic Preservation Board or at a state level. More needs to be done to save these buildings. So yeah. great for starting with the plaques, but I think it's a starting point. And I'm so proud that you're reinvigorating all of this. And it really is because of your enthusiasm and the enthusiasm of the society that we will have these buildings, hopefully in perpetuity. A couple things I wanted to say. Um, you know, the mayor and I cannot uh, talk about things outside of a sunshine meeting, but just to clear up uh, what he was referring to, to, to tear down buildings in a historic district, you have to go to the Historic Preservation Board, and they have to uh, find that, that it's appropriate to tear down a historic building, and they go through certain measures. We have Terry here. And my thought was that outside of historic preservation areas within the city, we have a lot of old buildings, and that somehow we need to protect those buildings too. So the idea is to go back hopefully 50 years. Right now we have uh, our staff looking into 75 years, which I don't think is enough, um, to, to be able to go back and have some sort of a catch to pre prevent demolition of a building without going through the historic preservation. So that's kind of the idea there. Yeah, good. Uh, yes, and absolutely. I commend the mayor because he's been working really hard to bring fight the transportation for the city. Yeah. One of the ideas, and I don't know if it was yours, Mayor, but maybe one of maybe you, you mentioned it if that was actually uh, your idea, although you mentioned it that <laughs> Stop, uh, it was your idea. <laughs> 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 Friendly. Whoever made the idea was a great idea. So play with I think it was Clive when you were in doing leadership Hollywood that you put together the walking tour. Yes. 
So it's the same idea, up then with, with Josh's um, you know, push to get bike transportation throughout our city to add a historic bicycle board to that. Oh, now, yeah. we're all yeah. nodding and saying that's great, but that does mean bikes coming through our community. But I think, you know, as the Lakes community, we would welcome that in exchange for having more people vested in preserving our history here. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of exciting things going on in Hollywood. And again, but for you guys, uh, we wouldn't be here. So thank you so much. And thank Her father, Aaron Schechter, built the Entrada Hotel. Now, why don't you tell the story of how you, your father came to own the Entrada, when it was new. <laughs> yeah. So my dad was building homes in Hollywood. He didn't build a lot of them, a few of them. He didn't do very well. But he was asked to, at the time, <laughs> he was asked to um, build this hotel. And so he built the hotel, and in the building, the owners, the two owners, said, we can't afford to pay you for this. What? Oh, no. <laughs> but you, we'll make you an, an owner. So he became, not because he wanted to own a hotel, oh my God. he became an owner in this hotel. And every Tuesday night, I believe it was, he had to spend the night at the hotel to relieve the people <laughs> oh who were managing it. And we used to occasionally spend the night at the hotel with my parents. Um, but he usually did it alone. But also on weekends, if the honeymoon suite wasn't rented, um, it had a big, giant, round bed in it. And me and my cousin and my sister used to spend the night you know, eating candy and sleeping on, on the giant The fact bedroom. that that hotel had a honeymoon suite is just... Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was a big, red... <laughs> hotel there was a matador out front mm -hmm. and a port cochere that you pulled up in it is like the vagabond in miami now yeah. when i go to the vagabond i'm like why can't we do that to the entrada i want to have this at the well, entrada it over again one, now so one more thing i just want to say about it that front area now which has all those little squares of colors yeah. and stuff it was all glass and there was a piano bar in there mm -hmm. and there were people every night there was a guy playing the piano and people would sit around the piano oh and they would sing God. but it it was all glass, so it was. It really was beautiful when it was glass, and when they painted it over, it was kind of like. Oh, yeah. Yes. Can I make a comment? Sure. Talking oh. about the talking about the bridal suite at the Entrada, my <laughs> wife and I spent our first night there. <laughs> and she liked as many people as could fit in the dining room and she was always cooking great yeah. meals. And she loved plants. She was oh, always putting garden. plants all around in the garden. Right. Yeah. Michael and, and Clive have made it even better. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's beautiful. Yes, it's beautiful. So thank you for restoring yes. it, guys. It's gorgeous. <laughs> if you'd like to get a plaque on your property, the criteria is 50 years or older. That brings us to 1970. A lot of people don't realize that 70, 1970s construction is now worthy of historic resignation, uh, recognition. So if you're interested, just contact the Hollywood Historical Society and we can uh, give you an application that you can fill out and we'll review the application. There's certain criteria that have to, have to be met. It has to be unique architecture, um, uh, have a lot of original features, be associated with an important event or person in the history of Hollywood. So it's not just architecture, it's also what happened in the house, who lived at the house, what it meant to the history. So there's a lot of different criteria. Um, but we'd be more than happy to talk to anybody that's interested in having a plaque put on their house. It's a very important program. So if somebody gets a plaque on their house, does that mean they cannot make any reservations? Absolutely not. Or having what does a, it mean? Having a plaque on your house is a recognition that it's a historical structure and it's got a story to tell. It places no restrictions on the property. Only the city can do that. The Historical Society doesn't make ordinances. We celebrate history. So we recognize history and we document it. It places no restriction whatsoever on the homeowner at all. And that is a big fear of people. I don't want to do that. I can't do it. Only the city can restrict you, not the Historical Society. It is a great uh -oh, day no, to be in be. Hollywood oh, and honor the. Let me get out of there. Uh, stop share. Okay, we're back, right? Everybody here? Yeah. Nobody fell asleep? You're muted, Karen. If only we could do this in real life. Really, would you mention the upcoming bike tour in October? Yes, we're finalizing our plans for the first historic bike tour. It was funny that Karen was mentioning that in the video. So we are going to initiate one um, this fall in October. It will be the first Saturday. I think it may possibly be full already. We may do a second one at the end of October. We're probably gonna do January, February, March, maybe April, it depends on the weather. Don't wanna do this when it's too hot. We're gonna start at the Hammerstein house. So participants will have a tour of the Hammerstein house. And then we are going to ride our bicycles through a lot of historic places in the lakes neighborhood. And then we're gonna go over the bridge to the beach. And the final stop will be the historic Carpenter house on North Surf Road. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. And we think it's gonna be a great addition um, to outreach into the community. Uh, does anybody have any questions? If anybody has a house that they think could be worthy, just let us know or let that person know to get a hold of us and we can uh, get the ball rolling for them. Also, if anybody has any questions, now's the time to ask. We've got a few minutes left before the lecture's over. I guess we told them everything they needed to know. Apparently so. Apparently <laughs> so. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Lynn, Lynn, I'm Lynn's here got again. a question. Okay, don't forget Parkside and Royal Point Siena. We have historic houses, and if we don't recognize them from the Historical Society, we will lose them, as you we know. We would love to get into uh, Parkside, so if you have anybody that you think would be willing, we'd be love to talk to them. Me, oh. I have to remember to do it. <laughs> we'll okay, come knocking thanks. on your door. Okay. Also, I just wanted to say next month, we're going to have a lecture on the history of the Hollywood Art and Culture Center, which should be very interesting. So tune into that next month. Any other questions? I have a question. Clive, uh, you've done so much research. You're, you're a wealth of information. Who would do the research if somebody decided they would want to put a plaque on their house? We would research that at the Hollywood Historical Research Center. We have a lot of site files for properties um, in Hollywood. We have a lot of records. We have a lot of old historic publications of Hollywood. Joseph Young's original Hollywood Reporters. Um, 
There was another one. I forget the name, what the name of that one was, but we, we really do have an extensive collection that's been well-maintained and organized by the researchers. So, um, you know, we, we have, and then we have access to the Hollywood Sun Tattlers. So we have ways that we can research their house if they don't know. We would love, we love that. We love finding out stuff about houses that we may not, we don't know everything. There's things out there that we don't know. There's houses out there that we're not sure of. So we, we love the challenge, so to speak. Well, the programs really got me thinking as I take walks or ride my bike around the neighborhood, I think, oh, that house should have a plaque and that house should have a plaque. Be awesome to. Yeah, that's what we're looking for. I see them too. And, you know, we do have letters that we can send people about the program and if they're interested, so we can put something in the mail to them. If, you, if anybody sees a house that they think um, might be worthy, we can certainly reach out to them ourselves. Great. I have a question. I have a Valerie? question. Um, yes. First of all, thank you. What a wonderful program. Thank you to all of you, Karen and everyone. Thank you. It was a very, again, enjoyable lecture um, afternoon. Um, question, are we going to have the Adam Walsh um, program at another date? Um, I know you've already mentioned next month. What a, it, is Here. that? She's muted again. She keeps muting. Okay, it's going to be next year, Valerie. I'm not quite sure the date. He is publishing a new book on uh, the kidnapping of Adam Walsh. So he wanted us to wait until next year when it's out for publication. Okay. Yeah. He canceled it. Um, but we've already done a second plaque in the Parkside area on the house of one of our board members, Steve Toth. And we're working on another one in the lake section. So this program is really going along very well and we're very proud of it. We're also, uh, just as an aside, uh, looking into Liberia for some historic uh, markers in Liberia. Um, you know, Liberia dates back as the beginning of Hollywood before areas north of Johnson were in Hollywood, Liberia was Hollywood. So there's an incredible um, history there that we have been in contact with some of the um, a local historian there to maybe not do a building, but maybe some historic markers of some historic streets where some well-known people lived. We understand that uh, I think it's Sam Cook's rel relatives lived on Cody Street, Eartha Kick uh, visited Apollo. Apollo was the segregated school in the 20s for all of South Broward. So we are looking forward to going in there and exposing that history for everybody to enjoy as well. So that's coming up too. Stay tuned for that. Okay. Have we any other questions? Well, Hannah, a you lot of chats. Excuse me. Looks like there's a lot of chats. I've answered some of them. Okay. Um, just complimenting us and thank you everyone. Okay really work hard on these lectures and we're really happy that you enjoy them. And if uh, you're in the Hollywood Hills area, that is also in the historic district. So you can get a plaque there as well. It's not in a historic district, but the houses are, especially there is a, a particular architect in Hollywood Hills, Charles Reed, who did a lot of work in Hollywood Hills. And we're, try we're working with one particular homeowner right now um, and hoping to get him possibly in the fall or the winter. Very, very interesting house. Very good design. So we're working on that right now as well. Thank you for that, Clive. Appreciate it. Don't want to scare the people of Hollywood Hills to think they're in a historic district. I uh, hear you. Okay. Erin, <laughs> before we end, I just have a brief announcement. Um, this Wednesday, uh, historian Dr. Robert Watson begins his lecture series. Uh, he'll be speaking on Truman and Israel behind the scenes, uh, behind the scenes look at statehood. He'll also speak on September 13th, ranking the presidents from best to worst. Mm -hmm. And on October 6th, he'll be speaking about the Confederacy. So if you haven't had a chance to hear uh, Robert Watson, he's really phenomenal. He's a nationally known uh, speaker and his lectures are of course free and open up to everyone. You just have to register beforehand. Um, okay, so great. We look forward to seeing everyone next month. Once again, Karen, Clive, there's no team like you guys. 
And thank you so much for bringing such an incredible program to our community. The Sterling Library Friends is so proud to be a partner with you. So thank you so much and we'll see you, you next month. Hopefully you. you will join us Wednesday for Professor Watson. Thanks so much. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.